Monticello is celebrated as Thomas Jefferson's architectural masterpiece. Built and rebuilt for more than 40 years, it is one of the most iconic residences in America. It stood at the center of a vast 5,000-acre plantation. During Jefferson's lifetime, over 400 enslaved people labored here. They worked from dawn to dusk, six days a week, cultivating Jefferson's fields and serving his family. Their labor supplied the income he used to buy everything, from food to scientific instruments to the fine furnishings for his house. Mulberry Row was at the center of Jefferson's economic enterprise. It served as the plantation's noisy, chaotic industrial hub, lined with workshops, sheds, and dwellings occupied by hired craftsmen and enslaved craft and domestic workers. As Jefferson's plans for his home and plantation changed, so did Mulberry Row and the lives of those who lived there. At any given time, as many as 40 enslaved men, women, and children lived and worked on Mulberry Row. For long stretches, white workmen also lived there, masons, woodworkers, and blacksmiths. Jefferson hired them to execute his ambitious designs for Monticello and to pass on their skills to his enslaved workers. During the early years, Mulberry Row included just a few scattered dwellings and workshops. Most of the enslaved community lived near the tobacco fields where they worked. White workmen lived in the stone house and in overseers' houses on the quarter farms. Enslaved individuals like Ursula Granger, who supervised the kitchen, laundry, and dairy, lived with unrelated families in barrack-style wooden dwellings. After a long day of work, Granger cared for her own family. She probably raised chickens, tended a garden, sewed clothes, and cooked for her husband and three boys. In the 1790s, Jefferson remodeled Monticello, bringing a new wave of white workmen to support the construction. Mulberry Row reached the height of his activity. Jefferson erected new workshops, a dairy, smokehouse, and washhouse. The barrack-style slave dwellings were replaced by one-room houses occupied by single families. Jefferson also experimented with ways to increase efficiency on the plantation. He began growing wheat instead of tobacco. Wheat required less year-round labor, allowing Jefferson to deploy enslaved workers in manufacturing. He started a nail-making operation where 11-year-old Barnaby Gillette worked alongside up to a dozen boys, mostly teenagers, hammering out nails, which Jefferson sold for a profit. By 1814, the remodeling of Monticello was complete. Construction activity decreased. Jefferson had more than half of the buildings removed along Mulberry Row and began adding more permanent structures, like a new stable and two new stone dwellings. The dairy, smokehouse, and washhouse moved to the wings of the main house. The stone house, where white workmen once lived, probably became a textile workshop and slave quarter. Here, 14-year-old Isabel spun wool, flax, and cotton. She worked alongside as many as a dozen women, girls, and boys, weaving coarse fabric to clothe Monticello's slaves. Thomas Jefferson died in 1826. Most of the enslaved individuals who lived along Mulberry Row were sold at auction to pay his debts. Families were torn apart as husbands, wives, and children were purchased by different bidders. By 1828, one of Jefferson's granddaughters said that the structures of Mulberry Row were lying in little heaps of ruin. Nearly 150 years later, Monticello began working to uncover the history of slavery through archaeology, research, and oral histories. These efforts have allowed the restoration and reconstruction of some of Mulberry Row's vanished buildings and have helped bring the stories of many individuals out of the shadows of slavery. The work is not finished. Monticello continues to study and interpret this important landscape of slavery.